Hello and welcome to part two of episode five of my Power Armour development project. Today I'm going to be talking about the suit in more detail and go over some of the reasons why the design is like it is. Now I could go on forever frankly with this with all the different stuff I've ran through in my head, different ideas I've had, but I'm going to try to keep it, the video to about 10 to 15 minutes just so it's not boring to anyone. If it's much longer than that I don't think anyone will watch it. And before we get going, if anyone's got any suggestions of what I could do for more videos, please let me know down in the comments. Ideally, I'd like to do build videos, but one, I don't have the videography equipment. And two, because I end up building stuff here, there and everywhere, I don't have a workshop set up to film it all. So unfortunately, I can't do that yet. I'm trying to work out on some more physical testing that I can show. One thing I want to try to do is set up some type of airsofting lapping testing. However, I can't do that until I have a working helmet with a visor, obviously. So again, if anyone's got any ideas on that type of stuff I can do as well, please let me know down in the comments. So now to the design of the suit, we'll start off with the arms. We do have a carbon fibre inner exoskeleton in the arms, as well as some rudimentary neoprene padding. Moved in closer, you can see the litany of bolt holes in the exoskeleton structure. That does allow you to have adjustment in 10 millimetres increments. I have found through this and through the knee braces that I've developed before, that is generally enough, you're always going to have a bit of give in flesh and muscle. So 10 millimetres is generally adequate. You can see how there's Velcro straps on the top and bottom, as well as having a large strap around the sides. In the future, I'll probably get away with the large strap around the middle. It just doesn't end up doing that much because it has to allow for give in the bicep and the tricep when you move your arm, which means it can just never be that tight. Whereas the top and bottom straps can generally be pretty tight while still being comfortable and not taken away from blood circulation. With the camera angle down, you can see the forearm, it does have a strap that comes around the side and it does actually have a sleeve sewn into the bracketry that allows it to fit comfortably on your arm, especially when you rotate your arm, your arm changes its dimensions quite a lot, which means you can't just have straps. Coming around to the other side, I thought I'd throw on one of the actuators that I've been trialing. I'm confident these are gonna be actuators that I'll use in the end, whether they'll be this brand or not though, I'm not sure. Frankly, they're a bit iffy on when they work or if they work. And this is a steady wind brand off AliExpress. So obviously there's no technical backup to it at all, so it's not ideal. I do intend on looking at some better branded manufacturers for when I buy all of the actuators, which should be soon. The really are great actuators though. They have a built-in planetary gearbox, basically around an inner motor. They have a very clever board that allows you to set torque holds, bounce settings, speeds, power levels which basically allows you to sense movement in the motor so you don't actually need extra sensors. There is a gravity assist code that's out there that can be used with these motors. Again, I just need to buy a brand that's actually reliable. And onto the pauldrons, as seen in the last video, they are just removable for now. I do intend on having the pauldron built into this part of the arm. There's no reason why it shouldn't be. It might also be flush with it. But as I don't know which brand of motor I'm using, I can't really design these fully until I know which motor is going to be going underneath. And as some of you may know, there may be a question on how much I can cover these motors up before they start to overheat. Again, that'll have to be looked into. And onto the chest, I'm just going to cover, again, why it looks so rough in general as a finish, despite the fact I've tried to hide it by wrapping it all in matte black. All of the armour is cast in moulds, but I've had to trim everything down like this curve here. And due to the armor being Kevlar and ceramic, it's incredibly hard to cut down. So there's no way at all of making a really neat job of it. It's just not doable. In the future, it won't matter because it'll all be cast as a finished product and it'll have a perfect finish. But unfortunately for this version, it's just turned this rough in general. And there's not a great deal I can do about it. As seen in the previous video, the part one to this, I have Velcro straps on the side. They open up and then the chest plate rotates up and over your head and then you put it down over your head and this groin pad does come off. One person in the comments did say why don't I try to put the British webbing design onto the suit. I'd like to do that in the future with the next version. This setup with the mullet is just basically what I could fit on it after I'd modified the straps and modified the groin plate. Which brings me on to the fastening methods that I've chose being Velcro. I did have some magnetic latches, basically a latch that locked over like that and then the magnet hold it down. They felt absolutely great, they clicked in really well, it felt good, however they just broke immediately. I re would really like to show you one, but I don't have any left, they all non-survived. 
And I thought, well, I could make them out of a really strong material, like say stainless steel. However, then you get onto the point of how do you fasten them onto the suit. One issue again with this armor, like how it is difficult to cut, is it took me two hours to drill four holes. Because again, you have to keep changing the drill bit over and over, depending on which layer you're on. The drill bit to cut ceramic is a certain drill bit that when you put that into Kevlar, it turns out it blocks the drill bit up. So there's just no way around the difficulty of drilling holes in it. Which means any fastening method to the armor itself really needs to be bonded on. There is a way you can put nut inserts into the armor when you cast it. But the problem is if the nut insert breaks, then that piece of armor is essentially scrapped then. You've also got to consider with something like this. If you knock something while you're moving, not even relatively quickly, but let's say you were doing a fast walk at least, and you had a latch somewhere and you knock the latch on a wall, it's essentially like taking a lump hammer and smacking the latch off. So when you think of it like that, you can see how there's no real way around making those latches indestructible and unable to break off. There's also the issue of when they do break, they're an absolute pain to replace and to put back on. Certainly not something you could do without a workshop. However, Velcro is cheap, easily replaceable, and it's very thin when it's put onto the armor. So you're very unlikely to actually damage it anyway, particularly compared to the latches. We'll circle round to the side of the groin pad. This groin pad is basically made up out of spare pieces of armor. I intend on making another one even for this suit. The only problem is it almost feels a bit pointless and it's not particularly cheap to make this armor just to throw away. The reason why I'm not sure it's worth doing for this prototype is that basically I've realized that the chest plate can be a bit longer, maybe down to about there, one or two inches deeper, and especially in the middle, because in the middle it does go up. I thought that would be more comfortable and easier to use. It doesn't really matter at this size. And also the thighs can be extended probably two inches up. Again, they're shorter than I thought they need to be. So when that's done for the next prototype, this groin pad will be significantly smaller, lighter, less of a pain because it swings. And of course, on the next version, I will fill this gap. I do actually have two plates I was gonna put there, but again, in future, it'll probably all just be part of the groin pad, uh, come around to cover it. I'm just on the note of Velcro, will it be strong enough? I'm 100% confident Velcro will be strong enough, providing that I get decent enough straps. These are literally just sheets of neoprene, with the DC back velcro on the inside, so naturally they're not that strong. It is worth noting that pretty much every plate carrier uses a velcro setup, typically having velcro straps that come round and then a velcro pad that comes down. That's the type of thing I intend incorporating onto the next design. In the last video, you may have noticed some parts falling off the suit. Most of those were from this backpack. This backpack was just CNC acrylic into a shape. This is currently all that remains of it. Obviously not meant to be a permanent fixture. The problem is I have designed around five or six of these backpacks, trying to work out what's the best shape and size and method of fitting and what usability it should have, whether it should have armor incorporated or not. And it really wouldn't surprise me if I've still got to make another backpack or two in the future. So when this one finally broke, made another one, to prototype this as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible, I bought some foam board and made a mock-up out of foam board, but I did want to have this out of carbon fibre with an inner lining of fiberglass so I could test the strength and how best to manufacture it. So what I have done here is I've then laminated over the top of it uh, three layers of fiberglass with two layers of carbon fibre over the top. Because this hasn't come out of the mould, the finish isn't particularly great. I also actually haven't finished this, but if I do any more work on it now, I wouldn't be able to film for it because the resin wouldn't be dry by the time I need to film. There will, of course, be a door on the front of this, which will be something like so. I also expect there to be a door at the top for any electronics fitted into the top. This will mainly be a battery compartment. The reason for the fiberglass on the inside isn't just me being cheap, but it is actually because carbon fiber conducts electricity pretty well. So if it can have a fiberglass internal, which is obviously under this foam board now, but if it can have a fiberglass internal, that will help against any electronic conductivity that might happen. The doctrine for this that I've imagined it to have would be to always really work alongside mechanized units for support. And of course, it could also be used for raids. They're typically short duration, again, going through room clearing, which nicely brings me onto something else that I'm trying to get across with this suit. And it's basically that I'm trying to make these prototypes 
show potential for the warfighter of today as well as potential for the warfighter of tomorrow. So for the warfighter of today, you might just want a fast helmet, for example, perhaps less armour in any increase in regular mobility with equipment that already exists. However, the warfighter of tomorrow and the future that could be on, say, the 10th version of this, with the optics that are currently coming out, will likely have a heads-up display built into the helmet. You'll have a fully visored helmet. You'll have the technology of, say, the F-35 Strike Fighter helmet, which is basically a mixed reality inside the helmet. You'll also have technology like what is in the XM-157 scope, which has the built-in rangefinder, target recognition, saving, alters the, the crosshair inside the scope, so we know where to shoot, depending on distance. You'll likely have all of that integrated into the suit, into the helmet, and into the rifle itself, which will then mean you'll actually need to look down at the sight and have a cheek well onto the rifle. You'll actually want it opposite because you want to have full range of view across and over as you'll essentially have a crosshair built into the heads-up display in the screen. All of that technology is already here. It just needs to be applied and brought together. And again, that could be the 10th version of the suit in the future, providing I can get funding. This is future editing me coming to interject. Well, I have done filming on the legs and the helmet as well as some other stuff. I've realized this video would be about an hour and a half long if I do all that now. So I will be putting that into future videos. Now back to yesterday. And that brings this video about to a close. I hope it hasn't been too boring just listening to me ramble on about the suit. I, of course, could have gone on for a hell of a lot longer than this about pretty much everything because so much has changed while I've been trying to develop it. I could go on for hours and hours and hours. But I'm trying to keep this as short as possible to keep people interested. I will take this moment to address a couple of things that I saw in the comments in the last video. I tried to keep track of them at first, but that video did way better than I thought it would. One thing was that it's too bulky or too big and it's not going to be comfortable to sit in, etc. It's pretty comfy overall. The next one, of course, will be better. As for the bulk, if you look up current images on Instagram or whatever of, say, Eddie Hall, the strongman, he's about six foot three and I think he's about 160 kilos, which is circa what I'll be wearing this. And I'll be about his size and bulk in general. And he obviously manages to function as a human being and drive regular cars and everything like that. And in the comments, there are a lot of great suggestions of things to do, ways to improve it, new design ideas. And I think something for people to remember if anyone's interested is that there's a lot of ideas that would technically work, but there's typically a time and a place for them. There is stuff that would be a struggle, like some suggestions of having sliding plate armour like Medieval Knights. That's a bit difficult because the armour is too thick to have that any thinner armour wouldn't really provide much protection. Stuff like rotating pauldrons, I believe some people said the Japanese samurais used to use them. The potential issue with things like that is any mechanical complexity is just a failure point, and particularly at this point in prototyping, it's complicated enough as it is. So any design ideas that increase complexity at this time isn't a great idea, but in the future, they could be good ideas that work great. So in a lot of ways, I have actually tried to simplify this design and make it as usable as possible. One example of that is that originally it did have interior armour on the arms, but it added complexity and did make the suit too bulky to say get through doorways effectively. Which brings me on to another general comment was, oh, you've obviously got some big panel gaps and that. that are difficult to cover up with plate, so you could add soft armour in, which is of course a good idea. But to pair with other comments, for example, being about thermal regulation, as it stands, it's really not bad. It's not too warm. Obviously, in summer, it could prove to be different, but it might not actually, in its present state, be much different than wearing plate carriers. However, if I add soft armour to fill in the gaps, it will essentially seal the suit in, and then it will be a furnace to wear. So for the panel gaps like that will be around here, what I intend on doing is having the operator have basically like reinforced u backs and other items of clothing that would have actual soft armour sewn into the clothing itself, only in the places that it's needed. There could also actually be more foam padding into the clothing, allowing comfort to be increased while not sealing the operator into the suit entirely. Now I did design it with the idea of being able to channel air driven by fans through either tubes or pipes or just through the foam itself on the inside, thereby creating circulating air to cool the user. However, if that thermal regulation can be managed purely by not closing in the operator tightly, then due to simplicity alone, that's a great way of doing it instead. 
As for help with funding and how to get sponsorships and whatever else, ideally in the UK, I'm still trying to get hold of Richard Browning from Gravity Industries, try to work out a few other people I could contact as well. I'm also looking at a UK government funding programme from DASA, which is an open call for innovation. I believe someone in the comments actually mentioned that on the last video. However, even though it's open to everyone, I'm pretty sure it's only really suited to universities. There's a lot of IP ownership that comes involved, the government's ability to basically take your idea and research and give it to someone else if they wish. So I don't think, certainly right now, that's the best thing for me to do. But nevertheless, thank you very much for watching. I was very surprised at how many views the last video got. Hopefully this will get some too. Please feel free to like and subscribe and leave any comments down below, particularly on any suggestions for future videos. Have a great day.